May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God and the fellowship of his spirit be with you all. Amen. My daughter had to make a new flag for Spokane last year. It was a university assignment for her 2D art class. The class was studying the symbolism and the representation that's a part of flag making that allows it to be representative of a particular locale and of the people living there. And so they were to study the history of their home city and then design a flag that included all of those elements. And so we got to be the critics, my wife and I. She would FaceTime us and show us some of the designs she was working on, and we got to tell her which ones we liked the best. And in that process, I learned a lot about our city, Spokane. Like, I didn't know that we adopted a new flag in 2021. Did you know that? The new Spokane flag has a field of green across the bottom. It has a field of white across the top. It splits diagonally across the center between those two with a river that's made out of small rectangles of different shades of blue that look like a flowing current. And there's a large sun in the upper left-hand corner in the middle of that white field. My daughter's design included another element of Spokane. We are known as the Lilac City. So it also included a field of lilac. Her design is lilac in the background with a river running through it and a large sun right in the center of it. And at the end of making that project, they were each to order this flag. It was then sent to them. And yesterday, she called us and FaceTimed us. It just came in the mail and she showed us her new design for the Spokane flag. The elements in her flag as well as the new Spokane flag that's officially adopted, or, or some of them are the same. It's the river, of course, and, and then the sun, the river, because it's such a distinctive feature of Spokane, but the sun, because that's our name. The name Spokane means children of the sun. That's something that we inherited from the first people to inhabit this region. From those indigenous people who lived here, the Spokane tribe, their name means, Spokane means children of the sun, in Salish. In the first couple of verses of our Old Testament lesson for today, the prophet Isaiah is telling the Lord's people in Jerusalem that they are going to have a new flag that will fly. And their flag will have the brightness of the sun. It's Isaiah chapter 2. Claudia read it for us today. I mean, Isaiah 62. If you want to take a look at the first verse, for Zion's sake, I will not keep quiet. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. It's Isaiah 62, the first verse and a half of that Old Testament lesson, the first five verses of Isaiah 62, that'll be our text for today's message. In it, the Lord is talking about not a fabric flag, but a flag of righteousness. And not a 2D dimensional sun that's printed on a flag. But he's talking about righteousness that shines as bright as the sun. And salvation that draws attention like a torch in the night. That's good news for the city of Jerusalem. Because for much of Isaiah's prophecy to the people of God. Isaiah has been talking about desolation and abandonment. Isaiah even says that the city of Jerusalem will be like a flagpole that's left without a flag when everyone is scattered. That's in chapter 30. Chapter 30, verse 17, the Lord says through Isaiah, A thousand shall flee, a thousand of them, a thousand of the people of Jerusalem. A thousand of you will flee at the threat of just one, one enemy. And at the threat of five enemy soldiers, well, you'll all flee until you are left as a flagstaff on the top of the mountain. That's a reversal of what God had said through Moses in the books of Moses, back in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 8, and Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 30. In those passages in the book of Moses, 
the Lord had said this is what would happen to the enemies of God's people. A thousand of them would flee. A thousand of the enemies of God's people would flee at the presence of just one of God's people. And all of them would flee at the presence of just five of God's people. And Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 30 says that would happen because the Lord was going to be on his people's side. He was going to be with them. And he's the one who's going to give their enemies up. Well, now in Isaiah chapter 30, this reversal indicates that the Lord is not with his people anymore. And that the Lord is actually working for the other side. That the Lord is the one who is giving them up. Until they are just a, a barren flagpole sitting on the hill. The people will be running scared. The people of Israel were in a precarious place in Isaiah's day which is why much of his prophecies are speaking this way about, about them. They're in a precarious place because of their sins. Our lesson for today came from Isaiah chapter 62. But if we went back just a couple chapters to Isaiah 59, we find out why they're in such a precarious place. Isaiah 59 verse 2, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Their iniquities are what have created this separation, caused this desolation among them. And then he goes on in Isaiah 59 to list just some examples of those iniquities. Would you like to listen to those? Isaiah 59, verse 3. Your hands are defiled. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongues mutter wickedness. No one enters into a lawsuit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies. They conceive mischief. They give birth to iniquity. That's Isaiah 59 verses 3 and 4. <laughs> the Lord's talking about the way they're using their court system. That they're not using it to provide justice for the community. Instead, everybody is filing lawsuits in order to seek his own individual advantage. Boy, it sounds like something that could be said today, too. And this is just one example of the sins that Isaiah points out that are going on among God's people. The chapters are filled with these kinds of sins, many of which we still see among us and among other people today. But the reason I pointed to this one is because right after that in verse 5, Isaiah tells us what comes of it. Isaiah says, from their sins, quote, they weave the spider's web. That's quite a sign of abandonment, isn't it? Cobwebs. Uh, cobwebs and empty flagpoles. That's what Isaiah has been prophesying for God's people. And in our text, we see that that actually came to pass. It's why they were given a new name. No longer were they called Zion. No longer were they called Jerusalem. No longer were they called by the name of the Lord's people. But in our text, in verse 4, we find out that they had been called forsaken. That their land had been termed desolate. Because Isaiah said that Assyria was going to come and take away the northern country of Israel. And then Babylon was going to come and drive people out of Jerusalem until nothing was left but cobwebs and an empty flagpole. The people would be running scared. But Isaiah 62 is about a promised rebirth for God's people. Isaiah 62 is about his plan for salvation and a new name that's going to be given to them. And so that's what our text goes on to talk about in Isaiah chapter 62. It says that at the end of verse 2. You shall receive a new name which the mouth of the Lord will give. And you will become like a diadem in the hand of the Lord. Like a royal crown in the hand of your God. They're going to receive a new name. Isaiah doesn't give any indication though in, in Isaiah 62 of when this is going to take place. He just speaks as if God's people are, are pregnant with such a new birth. But in the New Testament, we find out when it's going to take place. See, Paul tells us, Galatians 4, verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. 
Yeah, because Isaiah didn't tell us exactly when it was coming. Well, it came in God's timing, but the people certainly didn't expect it. The people thought that maybe Jerusalem had been reborn after the exile when the people of Israel came back to Jerusalem. And they rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, but the people of Jerusalem weren't reborn in that event. A few years later, the Seleucid Empire would come and drive the people out of Jerusalem. But then in the days of Judas Maccabees, uh, the Jewish people came back and they ran the Seleucid Empire out of Jerusalem and they cleansed the temple again for sacred worship and maybe the people of Israel were reborn there. Well, that's the celebration we know of as the holiday of Hanukkah. But the people of God weren't reborn in that first Hanukkah. And the people of God weren't reborn until the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Galatians 4, verse 4. Because only the birth of God's Son, only that plan of salvation through His death and resurrection could clear away the cobwebs and give a new flag of righteousness that God's people could run up the pole. And therefore God said, I, I will not be silent. I will not keep quiet until her righteousness shines like the sun. Until our salvation shows like a burning torch. And so Israel received a new name. And you will receive a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will give. You will be like a diadem in the hand of the Lord, like a, a royal crown in the hand of your God. And so she will no longer be called desolate or forsaken. That's verse 4 of our Old Testament lesson. So you shall no longer be called forsaken. Your land shall no longer be called desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her. My delight is in her. That's what the Lord says to his people. That's what the Lord says to you and me. We're not desolate. We're not forsaken. We are, God's delight is in us. That's our new name. And God speaks that new name to each one of us as we come to believe in his son, the one who was born of woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law. God says over us, my delight is in you. My delight is in you and you've received this new birth. Our gospel lesson for today was from John chapter two. But if we kept reading just a few verses beyond that, we'd end up into John chapter three, where Jesus has a conversation with one of the Jewish leaders named Nicodemus. And he talks to him about this new birth, this new birth that Jesus says comes to everyone who believes in him, who's born again of water and the spirit. And that birth again of water and the spirit is a, is a rebirth of faith that happens through the work of the spirit, which is why our epistle lesson that Claudia read to us today says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. But that gift of the spirit is also a gift that comes to us in water, in the waters of baptism. And so this rebirth in water in the spirit is both a, a rebirth by faith, but also baptism into Jesus' name so that we become a new people. We become a people who have received a new name. We're a people who have received the name that Christ has been given to us. That Christ is the same Christ that Isaiah spoke of in the Old Testament, that Isaiah said would would display that new name in us like a flag, like a signal. Isaiah spoke of the Christ that way back in chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, he said that the Christ would come from the root of Jesse, the Jesse of Bethlehem, the same Jesse who was the father of David, would also be the father of the Christ. Now, from the root of Jesse, he will come, and I will raise him to be a signal for the people, and of him shall the nations inquire. I will raise him up to be a signal, a sign, a banner, a flag for the people. But of him shall the nations inquire. That's what Isaiah had said in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. But Isaiah brings that back around at the very end of his prophecy. If we turn, we're in chapter 62. Isaiah's prophecy ends in chapter 68. And right at the end, the last few verses, verses 18 and 19, the Lord says that this flag of Christ will rise for the people, even though we still have sins, even though he knows our hearts, even though he knows our thoughts. 
Isaiah 66, verses 18 and 19. For I know their works and their thoughts, and a time is coming to gather together all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory, and I will set my sign, my flag, my signal among them. We're no longer barren. The flagpole is no longer empty. Christ, the Christ, the Messiah that that Isaiah proclaimed has come. And it's been run up the flagpole so that all the nations will be drawn to him, to his grace and to his forgiveness. And that flag's not flying at a half mast as if Christ was never raised from the dead. No, in the resurrection of Jesus... The Lord has raised the flag of His people to celebrate His victory. A year ago, Advent, so this is not Advent 2021, but Advent 2020, the second nation on this earth to plant a flag on the moon, a fabric flag, did it in December of 2020. It was China. And of course, you remember who the first nation to do that was. We were. 50 plus years ago when we put a fabric flag on the moon. The Apollo 11 mission put that flag there. You remember seeing the pictures of it? Looks like it's rippling in the wind. It's not really rippling in the wind. And instead, that's actually the wrinkles from the flag because of the way it was packaged while it was traveling to the moon and unfurling it. There's not enough gravity on the moon to, to weigh the flag down, so to stretch out those wrinkles, so it's just kind of all wrinkled up. And, and besides that, they had to actually put it on a frame. It's not just on a pole. It's on a frame. They had to slide it across on the top because there's no wind to make it stretch out on the moon. There's no atmosphere on the moon. And and because of that, they didn't have to plant it very deep either because the Apollo 11 crew could only get the flagpole to go into the lunar dust a mere seven inches. That's as far as they could drive it into the dust. And yet that was enough because NASA scientists say that it is still there. They can see the shadow of it, the shadow of this flag, when they look at that particular location on the moon. It's still standing. And yet... It probably is unrecognizable by now. 50 years later, it was a $5.50 government supply nylon flag that was put there on the moon. It was not intended to stand up to the kind of brightness and radiation that it would be bombarded with regularly on the surface of the moon. And it's probably washed out white and unrecognizable. How many of us are still trying to plant our own flags in places and make a name for ourselves? Maybe not through lawsuits and trying to get our own advantage in that way, but in what ways do we try to seek our own advantage, kind of stake out our claim and our little corner of this world in some way, where at least this part's ours, this is what we can control. To the extent that we do that, We're trying to make a name that'll last, but if it's not the Lord's flag, it's not going to last. Somewhere along the way, not very long, it's going to start to fade. Might be months, might be weeks, might be years, maybe 50 years, maybe 200 years. Eventually, it's going to get washed out by the passing of time, and that name's not going to mean anything anymore. But wouldn't it be great? If, if we had a flag that wasn't washed out by the brightness, but was instead enhanced by it. See, this is what the Lord says in Isaiah 62 that he wants for his people. I'm not going to remain silent. I'm not going to be quiet, the Lord says, Isaiah 62 verse 1. Until her righteousness goes forth as the sun and your salvation as a burning torch and the nations will see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, says the Lord. A few years ago, I was with James McMurtry. He's a worshiper here from Holy Cross. And I was helping him start a Bible study out of the Spokane Indian Reservation, of which that's where he lives. And he's also a tribal member of the Spokane tribe. And so we were out at the community center, the senior center at Well Pennant, Washington. 
And there in the senior center, they have lots of information tacked to the walls about activities going on there on the reservation and among the tribe, and also a lot of historical pieces that give information about the tribe and its background. And there was one presentation posted on the wall that was about the name of the Spokane tribe and where the name comes from, Children of the Sun. And so he was showing me these things. He was really excited about it and showing me. And as he was showing me that one and talking about the name Spokane and what it means, he said, you know, and he had just become a believer. He'd only been a believer in Jesus for a couple of years and had just been baptized a year before that. And he said, you know, I'd always known that I was a child of the sun, S-U-N. But it means so much more to me now to know that I'm a, a child of the sun, S-O-N. And he was referring to Jesus. And then he started telling me about connections he was making between their traditional tribal beliefs in the creator God and the creator he was now coming to know better through Jesus and faith in Christ Jesus. It was just a great conversation. But it also reminded me of something else that Isaiah is telling us in Isaiah chapter 62. That this is not just about a new flag for us, but it's also about a new name. And coming to understand our name in Christ in a new way. That's why in Isaiah chapter 62, the last part of it says, and you will receive a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will give to you. See, we've been given that new name in Christ. We've, been, we've taken a part of his name. We've been called Christ-like ones. Although there's a fulfillment of that passage, Isaiah chapter 62, verse 2, that comes in Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 where the Lord says to his people, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. To him I will give a stone which has a name written on it that only the one who receives it knows. And so which is to say that even though we all receive this new name of, of Christ, we're called Christians, Christ-like ones in baptism, there is also a unique name that God gives to us. And maybe this is something like what God did to his people in the scriptures. I think about Abram, whose name Abram meant exalted father, but then God changed it to Abraham because of the place that Abraham would have and his plan of salvation, that he would be the father of many nations. Or maybe think of Abraham's grandson, Jacob whose name meant deceiver or grasper. Uh, but God changed his name to struggles with God, Israel, because that's the place that his people, his descendants would have with God for the rest of their time, always struggling with God amidst God's plan of salvation. And so there is this also a unique name that God gives us, which has to do with our calling and our place in service and life to him. A unique name that God gives to us as we fulfill out his calling. So what, what is that name? What, what is my name? Or, or, or Jim McMurtry's name in God's eyes? What, what is your name? But I, honestly, I, I, I can't answer that for you. Because you see, Jesus said, it's a name which only the person who receives it knows. Revelation 2 verse 17. But it is so important for us to discern that, isn't it? To discern what God's doing with us in life to discern what that role is that we're playing in, in the course of salvation history. And yet we so much struggle to recognize what that is. And I think the reason we struggle with that and have a hard time understanding it is the same reason that Isaiah told God's people in his day they struggled with it. It's what we already talked about from Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you. Isaiah 59 verse 2. See, as unique as our name is to God, so also unique are the ways that we sin and separate ourselves from him. I mean, it was that way for Abraham. Abraham, who was to be the father of nations, well, tried to be the father of nations in his own way by having a son with his servant Hagar. Or Jacob, who... Struggles with God, well, because of his favoritism among his 12 sons, he also called, caused struggles not only with God, but between his sons and for generations there to follow between the tribes of Israel. So whatever those sins are in our life, whether they are repeated 
sins and patterns of sins, or maybe it's just a latent attitude that's in our heart and mind, or perhaps it's a lifestyle choice that we've made. It tends to hide God from our eyes, so we have a hard time seeing and hearing what this name is and what this purpose is that God has for us in life. But God brings to us forgiveness, and he brings to us his spirit, which is what 1 Corinthians 12 was all about, the epistle lesson for today. The same spirit by whom we can proclaim that Jesus is Lord, that same spirit is at work in our lives to give us this discernment of God's calling. So as we seek after him, we begin to learn what this role we have to play in, in God's plan of salvation is. And like I said, I can't tell you what your role is, but I can tell you where it starts. It starts with first empathizing with others, putting ourselves in their shoes, being able to see life from their perspective, beginning to recognize their needs. And once we recognize their needs, then trusting that the Lord can use us and our service to meet those needs in some way. That's the service that 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is talking about. If you want to turn and look at that, it's in your service folder on page 6. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities. But it's the same God who empowers them and everyone. And to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That manifestation of the Spirit, that is the flag of Christ's righteousness. That is what he's lifting up. When your service for Christ and your service for Christ and my service for Christ is seen in the world, that is the manifestation of the Spirit. That is raising the flag of Christ's righteousness that all will see it and come to our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what our God says about that? I will not keep silent. I will not be quiet until your righteousness. He's going to keep speaking that into our lives. See, keep speaking his spirit, keep speaking his word, keep speaking that into our lives at various times. Until when? Until your righteousness shines like the brightness of the sun. And until, you, until your salvation becomes your glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen.